I welcome this opportunity to deliver this Schumpeter lecture. Uh, this is not the first uh, Schumpeter lecture I've, I've given. Uh, I gave a lecture in uh, honor of Joseph Schumpeter uh, to the Schumpeterian Society a number of years ago. Uh, the Schumpeterian Society is a group of economists committed to understanding the role of innovation and entrepreneurship in a market economy. It's a markedly different perspective from standard economics, which, is fo which focuses more on equilibrium analysis. The pandemic and climate change, as well as the 2008 crisis, threw a wrench into simplistic equilibrium analysis, um, an analysis which has been particularly predominant in macroeconomics, but also in some areas of microeconomics. In my new book, People, Power, and Profits, I've emphasized the importance of scientific advances and their introduction into the economy as explaining the enormous increases in standards of living that have occurred over the last 250 years. Before the late 18th century, standards of living had been stagnant around the world for centuries and centuries. And then uh, something happened. Understanding what that was uh, is critical to understanding how we can maintain and continue the increases of standard of living that we've experienced. It's also essential to understanding how we can do that within the confines of our planetary boundaries, within the limits imposed on us by the environment. I believe that the true source of the wealth of nations, the title of the book that Adam Smith wrote in 1776, was the advances in science in technology and in the social organizations which enable complex societies to work. Uh, before these advances, uh, economies were relatively simple. You needed some regulation uh, for markets, even in a primitive agriculture economy, but nothing like the complexity that we face today. So the true source of the wealth of nations is both the scientific advances and the advances in social organization. And I would add to that a third, advances in the institutions and the mechanisms of ascertaining the truth. Of course, ascertaining the truth is what science is about, but ascertaining the truth is also necessary for the functioning of social organizations. We created uh, institutions, uh, research institutions, uh, uh, and independent media. And these uh, play a, a vital role in the functioning of our complex society. Of course, Smith couldn't fully appreciate all these dimensions that contribute to the wealth of nations because he was writing at the dawn of the modern age. In fact, he was part of the Enlightenment movement. And it was the Enlightenment movement which emphasized science and uh, advances in social organization like uh, the rule of law and separation of powers. Um, it was the Enlightenment that enabled those advances to go forward. So in my book, I emphasize how critical these Enlightenment my call values are to our past success and to our continuing success. We now have a better understanding of what contributes to sustained advances in science and technology and the ability to translate those advances into markets into actions 
which lead to higher standards of living, uh, longer uh, life expectancy. I describe this as a carefully constructed balance of government, markets, and civil society. Uh, one of my concerns is that in recent decades, we've lost that balance. Uh, under neoliberalism, under the ideas of Thatcher and Reagan, uh, we put all the emphasis on markets. But without government, without government investment, without government regulation, markets don't work well. In fact, uh, we saw in the 2008 crisis how poorly they worked. The financial sector, even though it was absorbing 8% of GDP, up from 2.5% of GDP, uh, wasn't allocating resources more efficiently. It wasn't creating higher growth. It was creating more instability. And so it was the absence of government regulating the market that led to uh, the disastrous outcomes we saw. The pandemic has provided another, you might call it natural experiment. Uh, it's affected all the world. It's been uh, a, uh, uh, an event of uh, uh, historic uh, proportions. But different countries responded to the pandemic in different ways. It's becoming a field day for social scientists, for economists, for epidemiologists, as they study what kinds of actions led to controlling the pandemic and controlling the economic aftermath of the pandemic. Who did better? Some countries did very well uh, across a range of, uh, 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 of, of standards of living. Uh, uh, South Korea and New Zealand uh, did very, very well. Taiwan, the United States, Brazil did very badly. Both in the dimensions of controlling uh, the uh, disease and uh, controlling the some of the aspects of the disastrous uh, economic aftermath. And so as we look at what it makes for long run sustainable success, we often see some of the same characteristics that made for good responses to the pandemic. So for instance, most advances uh, in standards of living are based on government sponsored basic research. Uh, we wouldn't have uh, the ability to respond to COVID-19 if we hadn't made the discoveries about DNA, basic research sponsored by governments. And we hadn't made a lot of the other advances in the decades after the discovery of DNA uh, sponsored by governments uh, in the advanced countries, uh, National Institute of Health in the United States. Uh, Mariana Masakuto's work in her book called The Entrepreneurial State has further pointed out that actually most of the major uh, advances, even in applied technology, are related to government investments. You know, we are uh, engaging with each other uh, over Zoom, uh, over uh, digital technology, uh, through the internet. And that was a result of government investments. Even the first browser was a result of government investments. And uh, you go across sector after sector, underlying the uh, advances are government investments. Of course, the private sector often has a competitive advantage. Uh, the private sector, including the small and medium sized enterprises and new enterprises, in bringing those advances in technology and science to ordinary individuals to increase to products 
that increase the uh, standards of living. And that's why I mean you need a balance. You need a partnership between the public and the private sector. One of the disturbing aspects of what has happened in the United States, where we lost that balance, is that every year President Trump has proposed uh, cutbacks of 30 percent or more uh, in the science budgets. And that's a recipe for slower growth and losing competitive advantage. But it's exactly the same uh, fundamentals that lead to, that are associated with uh, the good response to the pandemic. Uh, countries that had supported institutions uh, like uh, uh, for uh, managing infectious disease did well. The United States had one of the best institutions, uh, the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, it it uh, uh, helped other countries develop comparable institutions. But then in the United States, we lost our way. And uh, that crucial institution for responding to the pandemic uh, was defunded. We knew that there was a pandemic coming. We were warned by SARS, by MERS, by Ebola. And under Obama, uh, there was created in the United States a White House office in, for pandemics. But then, under Trump, that was disbanded. So the balance that I talk about between uh, the market and the state, civil society, requires understanding uh, what each part can do, their strengths, their limitations. They're not substitutes, they're complements. They work together. Good regulation in the financial sector leads to a better financial sector. Basic research leads to the ability of uh, uh, the pharmaceutical industry to develop better products um, and to deliver better products. Uh, and unfortunately, in the ideology of neoliberalism, they were seen too often as competitive rather than complementary. Uh, there are other aspects where the complementarity between the government and the market are absolutely essential. Successful private sector uh, needs an educated citizenry. And if we don't do that, uh, we are missing the opportunity to develop the talent, our most valuable uh, resource, our human resources. Uh, unfortunately, again, in many countries, there's a lack of opportunity. Uh, I feel that very intensely in my own country. America is often referred to the American dream, the land of opportunity. And it is true that it is a land of opportunity for some. But when an economist or social scientist talks about opportunity, it's not just that a few individuals can make it from the bottom to the top, middle to the top, and the bottom to the middle. It's about the chances, the likelihood. And unfortunately, in the United States, the life prospects of a young American are more dependent on the income and education of his parents than in almost all the other advanced countries. And that means that we are not fully utilizing a lot of our potential, a lot of our human potential. A market economy to be successful has to have rules. It can't be a jungle. In fact, the rule of law is one of the reasons why uh, the advanced countries have been successful. But it's not just having rules, they have to be the right rules. Innovators can use their market power to stifle future competition. They can stifle future innovations. And that's why competition policy uh, is so important. This is an area where 
Europe in recent years have been taking the lead. America was at the lead of this at the end of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. But then the ideology of the right, the markets are automatically competitive, took hold, and there was effectively a dismantling competition policy. Uh, as just an aside, this is an area where uh, Schumpeter himself was wrong. He wasn't worried much about monopoly power. He said, don't worry about it. Uh, monopolies are only temporary. Uh, it's competition to be the monopolist that is really important. But my own research has pointed out why that's wrong. Monopolists have the ability to stifle that competition. They can engage in actions that enable the persistence of their monopoly power. And as they, that monopoly power uh, persists, it can distort the economy and it will stifle innovation. Uh, in the United States right now and around the world, there is a great deal of concern about the quick rise of market power of the tech giants and the role that they've uh, played in stifling entry, stifling competition. Uh, the European Union has, has taken strong actions. And finally, uh, in the US, there is a beginning to take uh, appropriate actions. In the case of some of the uh, uh, tech giants, it's not only stifling competition, but it is also enabling an enormous number of, you might call societal harms from political manipulation, invasion of privacy, uh, market expo uh, exploitation, um, uh, uh, incitement, uh, hate, speech, and so forth. So uh, this is an area where uh, government action is absolutely uh, necessary. A key aspect, again, something that Smith uh, didn't fully understand, and I think Schubert didn't uh, uh, direct enough attention, is that monopoly power is often used for the generation of rents. And here's something that I've emphasized in my uh, new book. We want to encourage wealth creation, not rent extraction. This kind of rent extraction, exploitation of others, exploitation of their vulnerabilities, exploitation of market power, is the source of much of societal inequalities. And the recognition of that has totally changed our perspectives on uh, the relationship between policies aimed at equality and policies on growth. A half a century ago, Arthur Oaken, uh, the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under uh, President Johnson, wrote a very influential book called The Big Trade-Off, in which he said, you can get more equality, but only at the expense of lower growth. But the new view that I expressed in my book, The Price of Inequality, was that we pay a high price for inequality, especially when it's generated through rent extraction. We could have higher growth and more equality. They're complements. Finally, for a market economy to work well, for there to be innovation, we have to have a financial sector that functions well. And when I say functions well, it means it's not engaged in predatory lending, it's not engaged in market manipulation, it's engaged in the core function of helping businesses expand, creating new jobs. And a particularly important part uh, is providing money to new enterprises and for new ventures, for new ideas, for innovation. People often look at America and America's venture capital firms and our angel and say, that's one of the strengths of America, of America's financial system. And it is. But what is striking is what a small percentage of the financial sector it represents. 
how much more innovative, how much more our growth would be if more of our financial sector were devoted to uh, functioning, uh, uh, helping uh, new businesses and small businesses expand. In fact, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, the only part of our financial sector that continued to expand lending to small businesses was actually the only part of the financial sector that was not engaged in all of the abusive practices and the reckless lending. And that was our cooperatives, our credit unions, who had a different business model. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. I've talked about the importance of innovation, but there's one area where innovation at this point is particularly important. We are facing an existential threat, and that is climate change. We need to transform our economic system from dependence on fossils, fossil fuels to renewables. And to do that, we need rapid innovation. We've been lucky. In the last 10 years, there has been enormous innovation. The, the price of solar panels, uh, the price of renewables has come down at a rate that was totally uh, un, unexpected. It is now uh, competitive. There are still areas where, where research is very badly needed, including batteries uh, and more opportunities for bringing down. You have to ask the question, if we had begun the search for uh, sustainable energy, for renewable energy, 25 years ago, when we first began to become aware of uh, the dangers of climate change, or even more, if we had done this 40 years ago, where would we be today? We wouldn't be facing the existential threat. We wouldn't have the hurricanes that have uh, destroyed uh, uh, so many, had such a devastating effect in so many countries, the wildfires, the floods, um, and so forth. So this necessity of transformation is an enormous opportunity for innovation in every part of our economy. And it's an urgent need. Europe has made a commitment to become carbon neutral by 2050. An increasing number of countries around the world have made similar commitments. Japan was just added to that list of countries. Uh, I hope in a new administration in, in Washington, a similar commitment will be made. The question is, how do we achieve that? It's going to take as I say, innovation, it's going to take government investments, in basic research, but also in infrastructure, technology, education. It's going to need incentives. Carbon pricing can play an important role, but it has to be well designed, aware of the potential adverse distributive effects and actions taken to mitigate, undo those effects. It will need regulations to encourage further innovation. Uh, the regulations and uh, encouraging uh, lower emissions in automobiles have been actually very successful. Uh, economists have debated the relative importance of each of these components, but only a few economists at this juncture believe that we can just rely on pricing. And some of my recent research has emphasized uh, how you need to have a package of policies. And I co-chaired with Lord Stern, uh, International Commission that came to the same conclusion. But achieving this kind of transformation, achieving uh, uh, this kind of innovation will require the creativity of millions of individuals. 
And that's where the role of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship of small, medium-sized enterprises is going to be particularly vital. It is exploring thousands and hundreds of thousands of potential avenues of ideas. Um, some of them will pan out, some of them won't. And that was basically Schumpeter's basic uh, perspective, that uh, the success of a market economy is that entrepreneurial spirit, people having an idea, the energizing uh, role of having ideas and in the quest for uh, new technologies that address the needs of society, uh, standards of living will increase. And never has there been a need more important than the need we have today to address uh, the what I described before as the urgent existential threat of climate change. So this is a real opportunity, but to reiterate what I say, said before, to achieve this, we will need to have all the other parts of the economic system working together. We will have to have a financial system that serves society, but not, doesn't abuse society in the way that it so often has. We need to expand the venture capital funds, and the venture capital part of our, and reduce the scope for market manipulation, insider trading, and uh, uh, um, uh, abuse of market power, all the other kinds of things that have marked the financial sector over the last uh, quarter century. We have to have good education systems, making sure that everyone has the education to live up to their potential. We have to have government investments, most importantly, in basic research. The market can't do this on its own. And finally, we need competition because we know how dominant firms can stifle the potential for entry, can stifle the opportunity, uh, new entrants. Um, one of the sad things that you see so often in Silicon Valley is that the entrepreneurial spirit is not directed at uh, creating sustainable products uh, not directed at uh, addressing uh, the essential needs of our society, but creating a firm that represents enough of a threat to the existing monopolist that they will buy that firm preemptively to stifle competition. Uh, that's not the way a dynamic market economy works. So we have to create a more competitive marketplace with rules of the game that uh, allow the prospect of new entrants, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, uh, living up to their potential rather than being stifled uh, by uh, the tech giants or the other giants that have come to dominate sector after sector in our economy. So once again, let me thank you for inviting me to uh, address you in this Schumpeter lecture. Uh, Schumpeter had a vision of what a dynamic market economy was, was like. Uh, it was a, a good vision. Um, that dynamism leads to the flourishing of the human spirit, as my colleague at uh, Ned, Phelps, Ned Phelps at Columbia University uh, has emphasized. Um, 
that entrepreneurial spirit has the potential, as it has in the past, raising standard, standards of living for all. But we won't live up to that potential unless we have the right balance between the government, market, and civil society, a new social contract, which embraces public investments, strong regulations, including on the environment, and the right rules. We are at a critical point in time. We are recovering, hopefully, from the pandemic, or we will be uh, in the not too distant future. Um, we should have learned a lot of lessons. And among the lessons are the importance of science, the importance of good institutions, the importance of global cooperation, the importance of innovation. And as I emphasized, those things which made for success in addressing the challenge of the pandemic, I believe will also make for success in achieving long-term shared prosperity. Thank you. Professor Stiglitz, can an emphasis on SMEs help to rebalance the relationship between state, markets and civil society, which you say has been undone by neoliberalism? The central message that I emphasized in my book and in my argument for a new social contract is that we need a rich ecology of institutions. We need uh, uh, cooperatives, for-profits, not-for-profits. And among that rich ecology are large firms and small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, each of them has their own comparative advantage. SMEs are particularly important in providing opportunity. Uh, every, every big business begins as a small business. Um, and uh, that's why having uh, an economic framework that gives opportunity to SMEs is particularly important. In a recent interview, you referred to monetary bazookas, which aren't always very well aimed by governments. So how would you use the financial firepower that the EU is providing for the recovery? That was in connection with the massive amounts of money that were uh, addressed to the uh, COVID-19 United States, $3 trillion. But they were bazookas because they didn't often reach the targets at which they were directed. And here, the central message is simple. Uh, first, be clear about your priorities. Priorities first should be health, protecting the vulnerable, making sure that you are establishing the preconditions for a quick recovery. That includes uh, maintaining close relationships between workers and the firms, uh, uh, trying to minimize uh, uh, the extent to which people join the unemployment role. And finally, making sure that the money is a good bridge to the post-pandemic uh, world. Uh, as the people have talked about in the United States, building back better. Uh, it's clear that there were many things wrong with the economy and our society in January 2020. We don't want to go back just to where we were. We want to build back better. GDP growth as a goal is heavily criticized by lots of economists. You speak about sustainable growth. How would you define that? Well, sustainability uh, has many dimensions. We talk about social sustainability, uh, economic sustainability, political sustainability, and most importantly in today's world, environmental sustainability. We have to make sure that uh, our growth strategy is consistent 
with our planetary boundaries. It's clear that the current growth strategies around the world are not. And so that's where I think it's so important that we reassess those growth strategies to make sure that uh, they are consistent with our planetary boundaries. And most important and most imminent is the issue of climate change. You speak about the difficulties with big companies, particularly the tech giants. So how would you try to solve this problem? The problem of monopoly has been with us for a very long time. But the monopolies of the first part of the 21st century are different from the monopolies at the end of the 19th and early 20th century. Then we were concerned about steel, uh, oil, uh, tobacco. And the approach was a very simple one, break them up. The modern uh, mega companies uh, are much more difficult to deal with. Yes, we should try to do what we can to limit the size. There was no reason that uh, uh, it, Facebook was a, should have been allowed to buy uh, Instagram. That was a case where they were using uh, their market power to stymie a potential competitor, uh, reducing uh, competition in the social media space. Um, but today, there has to be much more focus on a broader range of behaviors associated with the abuse of market power. Uh, stifling competition, of course, is paramount within the competitive landscape. But many of the tech giants, uh, there are also problems with their ability to avoid paying their fair share of taxes. Uh, in many cases, uh, we've had trouble uh, uh, stopping uh, their engaging in a whole variety of social harms from political manipulation, uh, incitement to violence, uh, hate speech, a broad range of myths and disinformation, including about uh, vaccines, about the disease, about, uh, about COVID-19. Uh, behavior, spreading uh, uh, ideas, messages, misinformation that can really undermine the functioning of our society. European countries have done a better job of addressing some of these harms. Um, there are innovations now, uh, proposals in Australia and other countries. Uh, the time is here in which we need to have a systematic look at the whole range of abuses of the tech giants and use all the tools at our disposal to curb these practices consistent with our commitments to uh, uh, democratic ideals of uh, free speech uh, and all that that entails. Thank you very much.